Okay, so the topic of today's lecture is kind of an introduction to what's called segmentation, okay? And so last time we talked about thresholding, which was basically a way to take an image and turn it into uh, a black and white image, right? But today what we want to talk about is uh, are a couple of slightly more sophisticated methods for this process. So this is intro to segmentation. Um, and so I'm going to cover maybe two or three methods today that are kind of like, you know, general purpose segmentation tools. And as I'll show you, these are kind of built into MATLAB for the most part. And then next time we're going to talk about an even more advanced segmentation algorithm that is, you know, this is the pixel, the stuff that we're going to talk about today is kind of like at the pixel level. And the stuff we're going to talk about on the next lecture is a little bit more like evolving uh, a boundary or a closed contour to squeeze around an object. So it's a little bit fancier. Okay. So first thing I want to talk about is what I would call uh, basic region growing. So the idea here is that, uh, you know, if you threshold an entire image, what you may get is a bunch of uh, disconnected regions that are above the threshold, right? And as we're going to talk about in a couple lectures, you can clean some of this stuff up with what's called morphological image processing, where you can kind of select which region you care about and so on. But you certainly may get something that looks kind of like this. And the rest of stuff is zero. So instead, suppose I just want to get like one nice connected region of stuff that I feel like belongs to a certain neighborhood, right? So um, if we only want one region, kind of uh, if we want kind of want to click on a point for example and say we can do the following so the idea would be something like I click on this point and I grow out kind of a blob of all the pixels that are uh, similar intensity, for example, to that point, okay? So let's see what we can do with this. And the algorithm is very simple, right? So let me just kind of say that um, the basic algorithm is the following. So I take my input image x or i, right, for my input image I get what's called a seed image. Let's call that S of X, Y for places that I'm interested in, locations of interest. And as we'll talk about, you know, there are ways to get those seeds automatically. For example, what you could do is you could take these blobs here, and you can kind of shrink them down to just get like the centers of each of these regions and call those the seeds. In the case I'm going to show you for my example, I'm just going to click on a, a, a point in the image and see what we get, right? Um, but you could guess, for example, by, um, you know, thresholding. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, reduce the seed image down to just a set of points. Uh, so I'm going to take each blob of this uh, seed image that I got. Down to kind of like uh, a single point each. For the moment, I'm going to kind of, you know, this doesn't really matter that much. I mean, there are MATLAB tools that help you do this. One is called region props, where you could use that to get the centroid of the point. Or you could do something called erosion, which we're going to talk about next, not next week, but the week after, where basically you can kind of take a, a big white blob and shrink it down to a nugget of the center, okay? But basically, I'm going to say, okay, fundamentally, every place that I care about, I shrink down just one location. I set that equal to one. Everything else gets set equal to zero. And then the algorithm is really easy. Basically, I say I let my new image, let's call the processed image T, equal 1 if the image satisfies 
some kind of predicate or condition and zero else. I mean, this is super vague, so let me be a little more specific. So for example, I might say something like, um, okay, I want to get all of the points that are connected to a given seed point and I want the intensity of each of those points to be close to the intensity of the seed point. Right. So all this means is like saying, okay, you know, I click on a point and I say, okay, that point's intensity is 129 and my, maybe my threshold is 10. And I say, okay, now find me all the points that are close enough to 129 that I can find a path from that seed point, right? So it's kind of like growing outwards from that seed point, all the other pixels that satisfy that condition. And then once I have kind of a rind of pixels that don't satisfy that condition, I stop, right? So unlike thresholding where I could get, um, you know, points all over the place, here I'm kind of constrained to growing outwards from a given seed point, right? So it's kind of like saying, I have my image, I click on a point, and then, you know, my region grows outwards until I have, you know, got all the points that satisfy that condition, right? So let's do an example of this for a second in MATLAB. So MATLAB has a command, and let me remember what it is. Um, I wrote my own little wrapper around it, but let me just see what I call it. So region grow is my, so it's called gray connected. Oops, let me just uh, switch over back to here for a second. So this function in MATLAB is called gray connected. All you do basically is you provide an image, a row and a column and a threshold. And I've kind of made my own version of this where I basically say, um, you know, just grow the region with some automatically estimated threshold when I click on a point. So let's look at uh, an image. Let's see here. So here we got a hippo. Um, so again, you can do this in color or in grayscale. So basically, you know, my original statement of how this works is, you know, if I go back to my um, notes, you know, this thing here doesn't really apply necessarily only to grayscale. I could have this be like the RGB norm if I wanted to, but the MATLAB command only really works on uh, grayscale values, which is why I have to turn this hippo into grayscale for the moment. Of course, you could modify this to, to work in color if you wanted to. And then my region grow command is basically going to um, let me click on a point and, you know, grow all the pixels whose intensity is sufficiently similar to that point, right? So as you would expect, uh, I click on the middle of that ear and I get all the kind of dark ear points, right? And if I keep on doing this, I can, you know, click on other places and get kind of the, the gray of the nose, or I can click on the tooth and get just the tooth, right? Um, and if I'm lucky, I can click on the snout here and kind of get the whole, here I got, you know, here you can see that even though it may not look like it, this is a whole big ch connected chunk of stuff, right? Uh, and so uh, maybe my, if I clicked a little bit better, maybe I hit on a color that was, oh, it's even worse. Let's try uh, clicking around. Here, this is like, you know, a relatively bright area. So, you know, if I wanted to, I could supply a threshold that says how close do you have to be. Uh, as you can see, the region growth is pretty uncontrolled, right? So certainly that region that I click on could still squirrel out to the edges of the image. Uh, and so, you know, possibly I need a more sophisticated algorithm than this, right? So we're going to talk about some more sophisticated stuff in just a second. Um, and also you can see that the type of region that I get, you know, here, if I was a little bit more aggressive about my threshold, maybe this kind of white blob would have been a little bit more connected, right? It would have been a little more solid. And so uh, I could either fix this by being a little bit more generous about my threshold, or I could fix this blob with what are called morphological operations, where I kind of could fill in all the gaps in the middle of the blob, for example, right? So we'll talk about that stuff a little bit later. 
So very simple idea. Um, let me pause and ask if there are any questions about this. This is just like the warm up for a uh, beginning of the week kind of thing. OK, so let's talk about something else. Um, next thing, for those of you that are a little bit more um, computer graphics-y, uh, you may have heard of things like quad trees and hierarchical decomposition of images. So the second very basic idea would be what I would call like region split and merge. And the idea there is to say, you know, again, I want to find places in the image that meet some sort of a condition, right? So I could say something like, um, you know, specify a condition or a rule. And I kind of split up my image. First of all, maybe I split it into quadrants, right? And I say, okay, I set the quadrant equal to one if you satisfy the rule and zero if you don't satisfy the rule. And suppose that these regions satisfy and these regions don't. Then I say, okay, well, I'm happy with the regions on the left. Now I'm going to subsplit these images, subregions on the right, and say, okay, so now which of you are following the rule, right? Maybe again, I get some ones and some zeros. And I keep on doing that, right? So I keep on splitting up the image into uh, subregions where every region follows the rule. And eventually you can imagine that what I get is kind of like a, um, you know, a mosaic of bigger and smaller squares that do or don't satisfy the rule, right? So if I think of this as a binary image, maybe the white pixels would be the ones that satisfy it and the black pixels would be the ones that don't satisfy it. And so you can imagine you kind of get this, um, you know, kind of like chunky, uh, you know, blocky version of a threshold image where, um, you know, you can imagine storing this and implementing this very efficiently using a quad tree type algorithm where you kind of recursively keep on splitting the image and so on. This is kind of similar to the block proc command in MATLAB in a way, except that this is kind of more of a hierarchical thing and block proc is more of a thing where I specify the smallest block size and then everything kind of has the same block size, right? So again, this is kind of like a, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call it region growing, but it's kind of a similar thing to get kind of some, uh, everything in the image satisfies this rule kind of thing, okay? All right, so let's get to the more interesting stuff, right? So the more interesting stuff, I kind of alluded to at the end of the last lecture, we were doing this example with color thresholding, right? Where I was trying to find the yellow bananas or the blue of the box. And I said something like, you could do a better job with this if you started to use some sort of basic machine learning where you tried to find where the colors were in color space and kind of segregate them together, cluster them together. And so that's the next thing, which is what I would call uh, clustering and uh, this is gonna lead to what are called super pixels. Do -do -do. So first, I kind of need this idea that's called k-means clustering. This is from statistics. I don't know whether or not you would have had this in a class like, probably not probability, maybe a class like the very first machine learning class or pattern recognition class. Very easy idea. The idea is that, you know, suppose I've got some sets of points that are described in, in this example, just 2D space, right? Here, this is just XY space. And so the premise is, okay, you know, um, as a human, I can kind of see that there are these visual groupings of points in this two-dimensional space. What I want is an algorithm that will say, yes, you know, all this stuff is one chunk, all this stuff is another chunk, all this stuff is the third chunk, right? And so um, the idea is that, of course, in image processing, we have more than just... Um, XY, we have RGB, right? So I really have to illustrate this kind of like in a, a three-dimensional sense, right? Um, but the basic idea is to what's called do k-means clustering. Um, we want to gather n-dimensional data into natural clusters. And in this case, the user chooses the number of clusters. 
So how does this algorithm work? I'm going to talk about this algorithm in a very general way. Okay. So basically, you know, the idea is first you don't know where the clusters are going to be. So you kind of make a guess about where the cluster centers might be in this space. So first I will um, specify an initial set of cluster centers. And I'm going to call those M1 through MK, which are, again, in the same space as my data points. And then, very simple idea, for every one of my data points, for each of my data points, all I'm going to do is I'm going to assign it to whatever cluster center it's closest to. So I'm going to assign this. And this assignment is basically just like kind of the nearest cluster in the Euclidean sense, right? So for example, I'd say, okay, you're going to be a member of cluster J if you are closer to mean J, cluster center J, than any other of these things. So at the end of this step, I've had kind of a preliminary assignment of which data point belongs to which of the clusters. And now I will update my cluster centers to basically say, OK, now I've got new members. I update all of these means to say, OK, just take the average value of all the x in cluster j. Right? It's like saying how many points there are in cluster J. I take all you X's and I average them together. And I do that for all my cluster centers. And then I basically um, keep alternating two and three. Until convergence, until these MJ stop changing. So usually what I do is I kind of put a, a threshold on how far these means need to move before I can stop, right? So a very simple idea. I throw some possibilities down. I start to you know collect my neighbors for each of these possibilities, and I kind of continually update until I'm done. And as you can see, or as you can imagine, this algorithm depends on maybe where I start in terms of how I initialize. If I do a bad initialization, I may get bad clusters. And so what happens in practice, for example, is an algorithm may randomly throw down some cluster centers in the space and then run the algorithm you know, 10 or 20 times to see what results in the tightest clusters. Right. So in some sense, what you can imagine is that uh, some sense of cluster tightness has to do with the standard deviation of the points within a cluster. So if I've got a bunch of very tightly focused points, then my sigma is going to be low. And if I've got points in my cluster that are really spread out, my sigma is going to be high. So you can imagine some sort of a thing where I could automatically say, OK, if I give you a bunch of possibilities, this one is the best of the clusters. right? So um, for example, how would this apply back to image processing? right? So let's suppose that um, we revisit just like looking at the image histogram, for example. what I could do would be to say, OK, last time we talked about Otsu's algorithm for binary thresholding, right? which in a way you could think about as a way to cluster the points in the image into either black or white right? based on some sort of boundary line. But if I had a histogram that looked like this, for example, you can imagine that I could say, OK, I'm going to run some sort of a k-means algorithm with k equals 3, and maybe I choose initially the peaks of these uh, values here. And if I were to cluster, maybe I would find that all the points in here were one cluster, all the points in here were the second cluster, all the points in here were the third cluster. right? And so um, let's just do an example in MATLAB. So uh, 
First of all, um, hey, stop, stop, Hippo. This Hippo is aggressive. Okay, so, so there is a MATLAB command called k-means, and um, this does exactly what you want. So, in fact, I think that the k-means example, if I make this a little bigger, um, is in fact, well, here I, I think I just took the k-means example from the data file and made it into a simple m file. So I just took the help text and made it into this. So here, this is like saying, on the left is my raw data, which you can kind of see as a human breaks into kind of two pieces. And on the right is the automatically estimated k-means clustering. And then there's some diagnosis uh, here that basically says, you know, how much better did my clustering get as I iterated between uh, assigning pixel or assigning dots to clusters and updating the cluster centers. And so this this sum basically is saying, you know, how much better are things getting? And so things get pretty good pretty fast. You can see it was very quick. And then you can imagine applying this to images. And so um, I made a uh, so if you search in MATLAB, for example, for, um, let's just see here, image clustering. Let's see what it says. Segment using auto cluster. So I'm gonna show that in just a second. I thought there was a good one on, let's see, k-means. But there was a nice worked out example. Color-based segmentation using k-means clustering. Right? So they've got this whole worked through example, which I'm actually just going to do. I, I made this into my own M file. So if you do your own uh, Googling, you can do this. But here's just the MATLAB file. So here's the setup, right? I've got this color image, which is coming from like a microscope slide, right? And I can see that it's definitely got some purplish stuff, some bluish stuff, and some whiter stuff, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cluster in a certain space. Now, we talked about how you could cluster color. You could talk about colors in RGB space. In this example, we're going to do what's called the LAB space. And so here, um, if I look at the clusters over here, so what I'm seeing here is, first of all, the x-axis is A and the y-axis is B. What does that mean? That's kind of like the color components of each pixel. The one I'm leaving out is the luminance, which is basically just like the grayscale intensity. And so you can see that here there's, you know, kind of this uh, dense set of points. And if I run the k-means clustering on this, I end up kind of chopping up that cloud of points into three regions. And the three regions, if I go back and color which thing is which, end up being pretty much uh, the white stuff in the cluster is basically the white stuff in the image. The gray stuff is kind of like the pinkish stuff, and the black cluster is like the bluish stuff. And so you can see this does a pretty good job of segmenting the image into clusters. And then what I could do is break out, OK, here are the pieces of the images, where I can really see that I've got kind of all the pink stuff in one place, all the white stuff in one place, and all the bluish stuff in another place. And then as a final little cherry on top, I could say, OK, well, the blue stuff then is kind of divided into dark blue stuff and light blue stuff. And if I wanted to further discriminate that, I could bring back the channel I didn't use, the luminance channel, and say, OK, now I'm going to try and split this into a dark part and a light part. And so if I did that, then I could say uh, threshold just this image here on stuff that is darker than a certain value if we're going to use things like Otsu's threshold from last time. right? So you can see that with some pretty simple ideas, I can get down to taking a fairly complicated image and boiling it down into something fairly simple, right? And now you can imagine that maybe I could do something like, you know, count the nuclei, count the number of cells in this image uh, just from this series of steps, right? So the clustering idea is pretty powerful and pretty simple. So let me pause and ask, any questions about this idea? So you can run this demo yourself. This is just like something I found in the MATLAB help text. So nothing like uh, crazy fancy that I did myself. So this is okay, um, but one thing that's still a little bit unsatisfying is that um, when I do this, 
you can see that I still get these disconnected chunks of image, right? So if I go back and I look at the, um, well, I guess this is a, this is an okay example, right? So if I looked at just the pink stuff, I can see I've got pink stuff all over the place, right? Uh, lots of squirrely, weird shaped things, right? And so uh, what I'd like to do is lend a little bit more spatial coherence to these blobs that I get, right? And that leads to the idea of what are called super pixels. So this is kind of a cool idea that has a lot of image processing applications. Oh man, I got a zillion windows here. So let's go back to, oh, I messed it up. So first of all, let's close all these windows to make my life a little bit easier. Minimize this guy. Second of all, let's go back to here. Okay, so I guess before I leave k-means, let me just write down a couple things I said. One was that, um, you know, I could probably, um, could in general, for k-means, I could initialize with um, k kind of random uh, locations, converge, and then I could kind of do this n times and take the best uh, result. And so if you look in the k-means um, help, for example, it has an extra option that says um, not only could I specify k, but also I could specify um, sorry, I'm waiting for it. I guess you can use parallel things. Oh yeah, here we go. So basically, here you can say, okay, if I specify a number of replicates, that's what this replicates 10 is, this is saying, okay, for each of these trials, uh, you know, how many iterations did it take? How well did I do? And of course, if you had a GPU, you could farm this out to a bunch of different cores. If you wanted to, that's really going all the way. Okay, so again, let's make this a little more specific to image processing, because this is kind of just like a general machine learning, it's called unsupervised clustering, right? So, um, kind of a nice um, modification of k-means that's often used in image processing is called superpixels. And these are defined as regions of the image that are contiguous, meaning they're all one chunk, and have similar intensity or color. And to make this a little more concrete, let me just show you an example of what I mean. So, um, So here's my tropical drink. And so if I, again, I wrote a little bit of a wrapper around a MATLAB function called my superpix. Um, the MATLAB underlying command is called superpixels. We're going to talk about that in a second. So let's just suppose that I um, look at what are superpixels. Say I want to say divide this into 500 superpixels. The effect is something like this. Basically, it's like saying, find me 500 regions that nicely divide up this image. And if you look, every region kind of has more or less the same color. And uh, you know the regions are kind of tightly uh, divided along the edges of the image. And so you can imagine this could be pretty useful for segmentation, right? So if I just wanted to segment the cup, for example, I could pick out only the super pixels that I cared about. And instead of having to click on, you know, 10,000 individual pixels, I click on 30 kind of chunky pixels, right? And of course, if you also just color each of these things by its average value, you kind of get this nice impressionistic looking, you know, artistic rendering of the cup, right? 
So let's talk about how this is done, OK? So first of all, let's just talk about why we do this. Why would we want to do this? So in a way, it's a compact representation of an image, right? So um, we could take an image and with thousands of superpixels, super, I really spelled this wrong, superpixels, I could use, that seems like a lot, but I could use that to represent millions of pixels. And also, you know, in a slangy way, I could say this kind of keeps things together. better for subsequent segmentation. And that has a direct uh, effect on the computational efficiency of segmentation algorithms. So the last thing we're going to talk about, this graph cut algorithm, uh, benefits greatly from using superpixels instead of regular pixels. OK, so let's talk about how do I collect the pixels into these nice chunks, OK? And as you can imagine, it's kind of a modification of the k-means algorithm, except that in addition to just color being the dimension, I also am going to add the spatial domain into my ND data, right? So this is a special kind of superpixel is called slick superpixels. I mean, there are a bunch of different kinds of algorithms. This stands for simple linear iterative clustering. Okay. And so the idea is basically to do uh, clustering in this five dimensional space. So for each pixel, I record the red, green, blue and also the x and y, right? So I have some stuff for color, and I have some stuff for location. And, you know, this color, again, just like we talked about for the um, other example, you know, maybe I don't do it in RGB color. I could use LAB colors, for example. Okay, so here are the steps, right? Just like in k-means, first I have to decide on where are my initial center is going to be, okay? And so um, here are the basic steps. The first thing I do is I initialize superpixel centers by sampling n locations um, on a regular grid. in the image plane, right? All that means is that if I say, okay, I want to have 500 super pixels, initially I just space out those 500 points in a grid across the whole image, right? And just as a side note, um, you know, Obviously, these superpixel centers need to be in the middle of these fundamentally empty regions, right? So one little adjustment I might make is that um, I move these slightly within a three by three neighborhood uh, to lie on the lowest gradient position, right? That's like saying, okay, you know, I want to make sure that my seeds are kind of in the flattest locations possible, right? Because that's where I want to kind of grow out from. Um, we don't want to start on an edge. Okay. Okay. 
Now, just like in k-means, what I'm going to do is for every pixel in the image, I'm going to compute a distance to each of these centers. But now the distance is not just spatial distance and not just color distance. It's kind of a combination of these things. So I have to be a little bit specific about what do I mean by distance. So let me be a little bit cagey about that for just a second. Let me complete the algorithm. Basically, I say for each uh, cluster center mi, I'm going to compute a distance, which I'm going to determine for you in a minute, between mi and each pixel in a neighborhood of mi. So this is where it differs a little bit from normal k-means clustering. So what I mean by that is, let's suppose if I go back to my picture of uh, where I set down these clusters, there's kind of like this spacing S between where I laid down these things, right? And that spacing kind of depends, that kind of sets the tone for how big these super pixels are going to be allowed to get, right? So I'm not going to be able to cluster anywhere outside of this range. So basically, the idea would be, um, you know, for a given place, I'm only going to look in a neighborhood that is kind of S away. This prevents the super pixels from getting too large. Okay. And then um, I assign uh, one of these pixels, or I assign a pixel to cluster i if its distance is better than it was before. Right? So basically I'm saying, okay, you know, I already have a label. I look around to see what my, uh, you know, new neighbors might be, and I take the neighbor that has the best distance, right? And I keep on looping over all the clusters, and then I update the cluster centers like I usually would in k-means. And then I repeat until convergence. And kind of the optional step is if I want to get that nice kind of stained glass effect, I can replace um, colors of pixels in each cluster with the average color. So again, pretty simple idea. The only twist compared to normal k-means is that I have this kind of spatial requirement. And I also have to specify what do I mean by the distance, right? So again, I've got this five-dimensional vector. What is my distance? Let me be a little bit more specific about that. So, um, so what is the, the distance function we should use? Well, I could make it out of two pieces, right? It's kind of a combination of uh, color distance, right? So I could have a, a color distance, which is the usual uh, RGB at a pixel i and RGB at the cluster j. This could just be like my normal two-norm of the color distance. And I could have kind of a spatial distance, ds, which is how far away I am. And the issue with this is that the two distances here are not really on the same scale, right? So again, x, y is measured in pixels, so my distances could really range from 0 to, you know, the diagonal of the image could be thousands of pixels away, right? Whereas in color space, if I'm in RGB space, then I'm kind of on a scale of 0 to 55. If I'm in 
grayscale space or some other space that could be on a scale of zero to one. And so I can't necessarily directly add these two things up because they might be on wildly different scales. And so what I need to do is uh, make a distance that is something like uh, I divide my color space by something and I divide my spatial space by something. So here, for example, the C could be something like the maximum color distance possible and the S could be the maximum spatial distance, which as a user, I already set that in the initial phase of the algorithm, right? I kind of already specified that I don't want the superpixels to get more than S big. So this S could be the same as this S. I mean, this may be a little bit harder to guess, right? To know how far apart things should be in color space. And so in practice, maybe I don't set some uh, hard and fast number for that. Maybe I use C to tune kind of what my uh, trade-off is between the color distance and the spatial distance, right? So for example, if C is uh, big, that's like saying that, um, you know, if C is really big, then this part of the equation, this doesn't really even matter because this gets really small, right? So what matters to the spatial, so what matters to the super pixel is going to be kind of how spatially close I am. So C big means um, my super pixels are going to be more compact because they will favor keeping the spatial distance small. And C small would mean that um, my super pixels are, you know, more tightly stuck to, for example, image boundaries. That's like saying if I think the color is really important, right, that means that this term dominates and says that you have to be really similar color to me to be, to be part of my cluster, but I don't really care so much about how spatially far away you are, so maybe I would get super pixels that are a little bit long and skinny or a little bit twisty, right? Still subject to the fact that my, um, that my uh, pixels can't get very big, right? So let me pause and ask before I go back to MATLAB, any comments or questions about this idea? All right, so let's, let's see it in action on a couple of examples here. So I guess we already looked at my drink example. So let's see it again. So here I asked for 500 super pixels and I got this, right? If I asked for um, smaller number of super pixels, or actually let's start with a larger number. So if I asked for 5,000, then I get a very fine division. And actually you can see that, you know, probably from your saying, maybe this looks a little bit smudgy, but it's actually not that bad, right? So let's think about this. So this image originally is, uh, how big is it? Image. 720 by 960, right? So that's, um, multiply these numbers together. 691,000 pixel locations, each of which has a color, right? So instead, if I boil that down to only 5,000 locations, I get something that looks pretty close to the original image. And I could certainly, you know, say, okay, what if I was going to use about 10% of my, you know, pixels? You know, this image looks pretty close to the original image. Um, you know, maybe it's a little bit more chunky, but uh, certainly at first glance, you might not think that that right-hand image had anything wrong with it, but I'm using only uh, 50,000 numbers to describe it, right? And of course, if I swing the other way, where I um, only, say, ask for like 50 pixels, then I get this kind of blobby thing. You can see what the superpixels are trying to do. Even here, the superpixels are still doing a pretty good job of following the contour of, for example, this pink part of the cup looks like it's pretty well segmented, but, you know, it's just a little bit too big to really do a great job. So it's kind of like a question of, of tuning to see what you like. So maybe, you know, I thought 500 was a pretty good example. Here you can see that the super pixels really follow along the edges of the image. Now, this is all based on a MATLAB function called super pixels, oddly enough. So if I do doc of super pixels, it's either pixel or pixels, let's see. Super pixels. And so here, you know, I specify the image and the number of pixels that I want. And then 
Um, there are some other uh, parameters I can use. And one of those parameters is kind of this compactness thing. So this compactness number is kind of like the trade-off value of C that I was talking about before, right? So if I want to make C, if I want to make the uh, compactness larger, that means that uh, superpixels are going to be, so this is basically exactly the C parameter, right? So um, let me just see, I think that in my superpixels algorithm, I included this compactness parameter, did I? No, I guess I didn't. And if you're, if I didn't do anything fancy here. This is just literally uh, copying and pasting from the MATLAB help file. So it's not like I learned anything fancy to, to write this program. Um, let's try a couple other images. So um, so here is tropical fruit. I'm on a tropical kick here. So basically, again, if I look and see where are the sewer pixels here, um, you know, here I think that I have tried to conform more to the image edges than I am concerned about how square the, the pixels are, right? Um, I think it looks pretty good. And then uh, something like, um, so here, again, if we were to um, I'm sorry, actually, that this is, I think this is just an image rendering issue. So let's try and zoom in here a little bit. So here you can see, for example, that in the absence of any uh, real color change, like in the middle of this door, you can kind of see how big the superpixel is allowed to grow, right? Because there's like a big red square in the middle of this door. That's basically the superpixel hitting its upper bound on how far I can stray from the middle, right? And if I were to make the uh, super pixel number smaller, I would expect that what we would see is a bunch of smaller, uh, oops, no, no, not that way. I mean, I want the number of pixels to be smaller. So something like this. Yeah, here we go. So if I were to do this, I think that I would probably get inside here, you know, you can kind of see that there are some straight lines in the middle of these regions that kind of correspond to growing out from the boundary and going as far as I can, right? Although I was expecting actually a little bit more squares than I saw here, but you get the idea. And here again, you can see that the nice thing about superpixels is the way that they really snap to the edges of the image. That's a nice feature, okay? Um, okay, so you can imagine that I could then devise an algorithm that would say, group these sewer pixels into, you know, regions, right? And that clustering, kind of, you can imagine there's a higher level clustering I could do now on these things, where in some sense, I've kind of, you know, removed all of the image noise, right? So for example, if I look at this image here, you know, you might imagine that inside this rocky wall, there's a lot of texture that may confuse an algorithm that is trying to follow edges or trying to you know, uh, you know, go tightly around some boundary. If I do super pixels, then the insides of these uh, boundaries are nice and smooth. And so I don't get necessarily get caught up on little noisy edges that maybe I don't care about, right? So the, the important stuff is there, but I've kind of abstracted out the unimportant stuff, right? So for example, here, you can see that there are these uh, knobs or bolts or whatever on the doorway here that have gotten kind of collected into the same super pixels over here. And that little load, that little low level of detail has kind of been removed, right? And so that helps me concentrate on the bigger picture stuff and not worry about the small stuff. Okay, question. Um, it looks like in the super pixel image that the brick wall is just kind of like leading into the doorway. Is that a product of um, you know, just the average between the edge? Right, so it, it's not perfect, right? So if we look into here, you can see that some of these super pixels are straddling the, the door a little bit, right? And so that means that when I look at these shapes over here, then, you know, there's some burps, right? Um, because for whatever reason, uh, those, those guys did not converge very well, right? So where is that? I guess that's probably a little bit north of where we are, right? Uh, 
I lost track of where I am in the image here. It's on the other side of the door. So let's try looking at here. What happened over here? Yeah, so I think, for example, you can see that there are, I think that what we're looking at is this, right? So here, these superpixels, for whatever reason, have slid over the door boundary, and uh, I could try to fix that problem by, for example, cranking up that compactness parameter to say, okay, look, you know, you're not allowed to get too squirrely, and you have to conform to image edges, right? So I'm not sure if in my implementation, uh, so I think that the default value is something like 10. So what I could do is I could, um, I think it's called compactness. So if I could crank this value up a little bit, let's see if we can make this any better. So thinking, thinking, okay, now this is interesting. So uh, what happened here looks a little bit better. And actually these super pixels look a lot different, right? So now, um, actually these almost look like they're inclined to be squares, but I, I only have a little bit of a burp over the edge, right? And let's actually go the other way just to see what happens. So what if I make my number a lot smaller than I think the default is? I'm not sure how much of a difference we're going to see here. I mean, there definitely is some sort of qualitative difference, right? So again, there's no magic bullet to make this work, but it generally works pretty well. Um, and so uh, you can play with this at home to, to see how this works. I believe that I have, I guess I didn't write the next homework yet, but I'll probably put some sort of super pixely problem for you to play with your own images. Okay, other comments or questions? All right, so the last concept I want to talk about today is... Um, Let's close all this junk up and clear all my stuff, make my world nice. So um, last concept is a idea that has really swept computer vision by storm and maybe like the, well, I know it sounds boring to you guys. You guys were all born in the 90s. But so in the late 90s, mid 90s, there was like all this excitement about this thing called graph cuts, right? And so I want to talk about a little bit what, what that is. And so um, graph cut segmentation. So the idea here is the following. So what I want to do is I want to, um, here we're going to only talk about splitting the image into two pieces, basically like foreground and background, right? So this is the kind of idea is to separate foreground and background. Okay, so the philosophy behind graph cuts is that, you know, thresholding and simple algorithms like that are gonna fail when both the foreground and the background are pretty complicated in terms of texture, color, right? So I mean, thresholding will work great when you've got like a big blue ball that you wanna segment, right? But it won't work so well if you've got like a zebra that you wanna segment, right? Where there's black and white and the background is green and grassy and there are trees. So for complex images, segmentation can be challenging and thresholding, basic thresholding and stuff like that is not gonna be up to the task. Right, so um, the idea here is kind of clever and I'm going to kind of uh, draw it first like this and I'll show you a better rendering that I made previously. So kind of the idea is that I've got my image plane here and each of these pixels is, each of these dots is a pixel basically. This is not very even, but okay. and. I have what I'm going to call a foreground terminal and a background terminal. Okay. And so what I want to do is I want to find a way 
to uh, so initially every one of these pixels is connected to both the foreground and the background. This is why it's kind of tough to draw on a piece of paper. Let me show you a nicer picture. Right, so the setup is the one at the left, right? So I've got, in this case, just three by three pixel grid, very simple. Each of these pixels is initially connected to the foreground and the background. What I wanna do is I want to cut some of these edges so that after I slice some of these edges, I've disconnected this graph into one chunk that belongs to the foreground and one chunk that belongs to the background, right? And that kind of implies a segmentation, right? That's like saying that all the stuff that belongs with B is background, all the stuff that's connected to F is foreground, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna kind of use my scissors and chop through these gray edges and these black edges until there's no way I can get from F to B along some set of paths, okay? So that's the name of the game. So this separation, anything that separates the foreground and the background is what's called a cut, okay, a cut on the graph. And what I wanna do in some sense is find the best cut or what we call the minimum cut, okay? So let me go back to here. So basically the idea is a cut is a set of edges that when removed separates these F and B terminals. And that cut kind of implies a segmentation, okay? And so what I wanna do is find the best cut. What do I mean by that? Well, we assign a weight to each edge And if you go back to this um, image, you see there are two kinds of edges, right? There are edges between the pixels in the image, these black lines, and then there are edges between each pixel in the foreground and background, these gray lines. So what I'm gonna do is we assign a weight to each of these edges, both um, pixel to pixel and pixel to terminal. And the idea is we want to find the minimum cut. That is, um, if I call C a cut, the set of edges, the sum over all the edges in C of the weights that I've sliced away, okay? Okay, so let's think about um, kind of intuition for how I should set these weights, right? So I want there to be, um, you know, so again, the, the intuition is that stuff that is relatively the same color should be, um, preserved, right, should be kind of kept together. And stuff that is uh, far apart, uh, like if there's an edge, I should be okay with kind of cutting the line that connects those two pixels because I want those to be on opposite sides of the segmentation, okay? So let's formalize that first, right? So um, between adjacent pixels, we could use something like um, the weight is gonna be, um, you know, maybe I normalize for the distance between I and J. So again, if I'm just looking at uh, adjacent pixels, that distance is probably always gonna be one, right? So in some sense, I don't even have to worry about this term. The most important part is I have E to the minus, you know, some variance times the difference between these pixels. Right? So if ij is similar to ii, then this number is close to zero, 
and I get something like 1, right? If i, i is not like i, j, then I have something where this is something like e to the minus big number, and that's going to be like 0, right? So the idea is that for neighbors who have different colors, the graph cut algorithm is inclined to remove them because there's a very low weight to doing so, a very low cost to doing that, right? So basically, I have low cost to cut dissimilar um, edges. Okay. And also, you know, at the end of the day, I can only connect my pixel to either the foreground or the background, right? And so I also need to have a weight that says how similar am I to the foreground node and how similar am I to the background node. And that's where there's a little bit more uh, of an advanced idea coming in, which is that um, we let the user what I could call scribble on the image to denote some uh, initial foreground and background pixels. And those scribbles basically form um, probability distributions. probability that I'm in the foreground given a color and the probability that I'm in the background given a color. And so scribbling does two things, right? So first of all, when I scribble on the image, I am nailing down to say, you know, the scribbled points have to be belonging with either the foreground or the background. So number one, um, you know, the scribbled um, pixels are forced to stick with one terminal. And how I do that, for example, is that if I have a foreground pixel, my weight between my pixel and the foreground node, I could just manually set to be infinity or some massive number, just so expensive that you never cut it. While the weight between me and my background is zero, right? So I definitely, there's no cost to cutting that. And vice versa for um, a, a pixel that I've scribbled as background. And then other pixels, um, I could use something like the weight between me and the foreground is something like some scalar times the log of this and vice versa. So this maybe seems a little bit backwards, right? But let's think about this for a second. So suppose that the probability that I am background is very low, right? So that means that FB is very low. That means that log of this very small close to zero number is going to be close to like minus infinity, which means that the weight on that is going to be very large, right? Whereas, you know, these probabilities basically, so that means that if the foreground, if this is probably low, then this is probably high, which means that this number is going to be relatively uh, low, right? Meaning that, uh, I got myself turned around. So again, let me say this one more time. So if the foreground, if the background probability is low, right? So FB being low means that log FB is going to be like, you know, big negative number, which means that this number is going to be um, big positive number, right? That makes sense. So I should be comfortable uh, leaving that as a likely foreground pixel, right? So the idea is that I scribble on the image, I kind of seed 
some foreground and background pixels, all the other pixel values kind of follow along to say, okay, so if I'm kind of similar to something that was already scribbled as foreground, then it's going to be, you know, a high value on that edge between me and the foreground node. So let me make this a little more concrete. So MATLAB has this graph cut algorithm built in. Um, and where is it? It's in this kind of a different thing. You go to apps, then you go to image processing, computer vision, image segmenter. So this brings up a little um, GUI that has all sorts of stuff in it. Um, so let's load an image. Uh, I believe I had a... Okay, so here is an image. And so if I go to graph cut, it lets me, it kind of walks me through it. So step one, mark a foreground object. So I can use my mouse and I can scribble to say, okay, just very casually, this is the stuff that I think is foreground. Then I say mark background, I say very casually, okay, this is the stuff I think is background. Now it goes off and automatically makes a segmentation that says, okay, stuff that is kind of similar to the foreground intensity gets clustered into foreground, stuff that is similar to the background gets clustered into background. And I can see that's not perfect, right? But it's already pretty good. And if I were to do some more scribbling, like say, no, no, this is background, and this is background, and this is background, and then maybe I say, oh, but this is foreground over here. So the nice thing is that the segmentation can kind of be iteratively recomputed. And if I kind of uh, use that to make a segmentation, I can see that I can fairly quickly kind of sketch out this foreground object, even though um, it's actually got a fair amount of, um, you know, edges and texture and stuff like that. The background's complicated, the foreground's complicated, but I can still do this thing where, again, sketching on the koala basically says I'm seeding the algorithm to say, okay, I think the foreground stuff that I want is grayish and whitish, and I think the background stuff that I want is brownish and greenish and so on, right? So it's a pretty slick and simple algorithm. Let's see if we can try it on something else here. So, um, Let's try, so let's see what happens here. Airplane. So again, graph cut, all I do is I kind of sketch along the stuff I think is foreground. Again, this is a very complicated image, right, in terms of color. And I say, okay, I think this stuff is background. Let's see what we got. It's thinking, I assume. I guess for some reason. Oh, ha, you're right. Let's go back. I guess I was too opaque. Oh yeah, actually I did okay, right? So uh, I'm not sure I can go back to my sketching thing. Let's try that again. Right. So let's repeat the example. Do do do. Sketch on here. So again, when I sketch, I kind of want to make sure I get a little bit of all the stuff that I think is going to be relevant. And I did pretty well. And I can kind of sketch a little bit more on here. Uh-oh. Sketch over here. So it's a little bit sloppy. To be honest, no offense to MATLAB, I think that their implementation is not... There, there are smarter implementations of this, and I'll show you one more before I do this. But let me just say that... Um, Let's go back to the idea we had last time with super pixels. So here, if I sh do sub show subregions, you can see that actually this graph cut algorithm is under the hood implemented by collecting super pixels together, not collecting pixels together, right? So that may account for some of the weird stuff. In fact, you can see that I was, uh, you know, it was a fool's errand to try to do things over here. No, not you, right? Because you can see that these super pixels actually overlap the nose of the plane and the background, right? So I could never have necessarily gotten the plane on one side and the, and the ground on the others because these are bad super pixels, right? So, you know, maybe if there was a way for me to tune my super pixels, I could do a little bit better uh, and that would account for better segmentation. I do have another uh, graph cut implementation that I um, had from 
there's a different one. So here, this is, there's a modification of the graph cut algorithm called grab cut, which is kind of neat. Um, without going into too many details, the fundamental innovation is that all I have to do is draw a, a bounding box around the foreground. And then, I believe that's all I have to do, right? Is it thinking? Is it stalled? Not responding? Oh, here we go. So, I mean, that did pretty well right out of the gate, right? And if I go to, um, go back to my image, I guess I have this overlay, right? So I can see actually this was much better and probably this image isn't being segmented using super pixels. It's probably segmented using actual pixels, which kind of accounts for why the detail is much finer. But just like in the other MATLAB interface, I can click and say, okay, no, actually this stuff here you missed, it was foreground and it will automatically uh, update. I guess my computer is a little bit slow because of all the other junk I have running on this. Yeah, so here I think this is a pretty decent segmentation that came just from drawing a bounding box and editing it a little bit. And so what's happening is that more or less inside the bounding box is used to seed the foreground density outside the bounding box is used to see the background density, right? Um, and so the reason that graph cuts became so popular in image processing computer vision is that, you know, it used to be thought that solving this minimum cut problem was super time consuming computationally, right? Um, and then there were a couple of kind of groundbreaking papers. Uh, Boykov is the guy who was really involved in it and his colleagues uh, who showed that for the kinds of segmentation problems that you find in image processing, where instead of having like this random graph with vertices and edges, you have a very regimented pixel level graph where only you've got kind of pixels connected to their four neighbors, they showed that there are very efficient ways of solving graph cut problems on those kinds of grid-based graphs. And that's what turned this into a computationally feasible algorithm, because as you can see, I'm able to update this on the fly, right? Um, now, that being said, I think that you'll still find that graph cut algorithms may choke a little bit if you load up a massive, you know, 15 megapixel image. I think that you'll start to see MATLAB struggling even if it's using super pixels behind the hood, right? So um, you're still having to create a fundamentally large graph between all of the edges of, between pixels in the image, right? Um, and also just as a side note, you know, if you took uh, algorithms, for example, here, you probably learned about max flow problems, min cut problems, Ford Fulkelson algorithm. Those are the things that are kind of under the hood for solving these kinds of problems. So in general, these computational problems are inherited from this idea of, you know, uh, well, the, the dual so-called the minimum cut problem is this maximum flow problem of basically how much stuff can I push from point A to point B along these links that have finite capacity, right? And so that problem turns out to be uh, related to the minimum cut problem. And so uh, if you took algorithms, you learned about ways to solve that problem. Okay, so I think that's a good place to stop for a moment. Let me pause and ask if there are any comments or questions. Yes? So when you see the super pixels to do the pipe, do they give any weight to how much the super pixels, uh, like the, the boundary area between the super pixels, or is it still the like four neighborhood? Um, so I believe that. So the super pixels are definitely probably like four neighborhood or eight neighborhood, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of connectivity, but it would be nice. So clearly there's no, in this little GUI thing, there's clearly no way to tune anything about the super pixel size, right? So here, um, you know, I don't see any little knobs that I can turn to change things, right? So you could do this yourself very easily by going to the super pixels command in MATLAB and modifying how many you wanted and then you could call the graph cut algorithm on that. So I think that under the hood, now don't quote me on this, let's see what the function is in MATLAB. So um, I think if I just look for graph cut. So segment image with graph cut. Yes, so I believe that probably under the hood, it's using this max flow command, but let's see. Graph cut, graph cut. So here it's wanting me to use the segmenter, but let's see if there's an actual file that goes along with it. I mean, I feel like it's gotta be something where I can use it um, without having to go through the GUI. 
image segmentation analysis. So again, all this stuff is nicely built into MATLAB. Color threshold or image segmenter functions. Okay, so gray thresh, multi thresh. So you've learned about some of this stuff already. It could be lazy snapping. Yes, so that's what it's called. So basically, here, this is what's under the hood of the algorithm, and um, it's using the superpixels to, to do this. So here, I mean, it makes it a little bit chunkier because you have to now specify the foreground background. Instead of giving you the GUI, you have to specify some points and so on, right? But if you want to do this yourself, then lazy snapping is the function that you would use to, to do it. And of course, all this stuff is also built into OpenCV and stuff like that by now, so Python. Okay, other questions or comments? Great, so next time we're gonna talk about uh, a more advanced method that basically, you know, we're really gonna model the shape of the curve that is gonna go around the foreground of the object. We're gonna talk about how to evolve that curve step-by-step step to tightly wrap around it. So that's gonna be called snakes and active contours. So I'll see you next time. And now I will turn off this guy.